Hey guys, welcome to another in our series of kit reviews. Uh, a complaint was recently filed with me that I uh, basically need to shut up and do some more kit reviews. Uh, I find that partially ironic considering the fact that all I'm going to do is talk a lot and occasionally point at things. So, hey, you know, whatever makes you guys happy. Um, you know, I, I'm growing increasingly sensitive to these type of things due to the fact that, you know, I've gotten a thumbs down here recently, and we all know the drama that that can cause. And I couldn't care less, honestly. Um, I've just been uh, promising you guys kit reviews that I'm not delivering. I do want to do more of them. I have a plethora of things that you probably see behind me that you want to see that I do all the acquisition videos where I go, oh, look at all these goodies, and then we never talk about the contents. So it is something I want to do more of, and I have a few seconds here this evening to uh, pull one out, so uh, <laughs> get your mind out of the gutter and enjoy this. This is going to be a review of the relatively new, this came out in uh, January, the beginning of this year, so it's about six months old now. Uh, 2014, maybe it's a Ford, maybe it's not, you can't tell by the box art, right, because it doesn't say it, Mustang GT. What this kit is, is a uh, modified reissue of the 2014 Ford GT pre-paint kit that was released, uh, was a February of last year. Uh, this was released also at the same time they did the uh, unpainted version of the Corvette ZL1 that also is a modified reissue. Basically, the only thing that's different about this kit, other than the fact that it's not painted, it does not pre-paint, molded in white, and it has real decals instead of that tampo printed crap that came on the kits, which, uh, you know, if you follow along with us, you know that the tampo printed stuff, and the, all you need is two functioning eyeballs and look at them yourself, tends to not be even. Uh, the stripes don't run the entire length of what they're supposed to run. Uh, and then, of course, there's always the problem that if you don't want the car in the color that it comes in, uh, stripping everything off, you have no options to replace the stripes. So in this kit, there are real decals, however, there are no uh, racing stripes or anything else like that that you would expect on a Ford GT. Uh, you see here on the box, it's got sort of these uh, swoosh graphics that run down the side here. Those are replicated in decals. And then there's the factory stock decals. By the way, you can just build this as a you know, plain run-of-the-mill uh, 2014 Ford Mustang without the uh, big goofy... Uh, mag wheels and the, or I should say the spoke wheels and the giant cowl induction hood. Frankly, I can't stand that look. What the thing looks like to me is a car that was given to a 19 year old without any kind of money or taste and they decided to make performance options by adding a hood and giant tires to it and it's just for the look. Uh, there's no like uh, upgraded engine parts or anything in this kit to make it sort of a drag car to make the cowl induction hood uh, be worth what it's for but be that as it may it's still there and the cowl induction and the big goofy uh, wheels uh, that are sort of California wheel style kind of things low profile tires big wheels uh, are the only really optional new tool parts that come in this kit that aren't in that pre-painted kit that's silver so we're going to spin the camera around. I finally, part of the reason I couldn't do kit reviews, I couldn't find my little backdrop. We'll put the backdrop down so you guys can see because white, of course, is very hard to film. And uh, we'll give you guys a, a look see into what makes up this kit. It's a pretty simplified kit, it is only 60 pieces. Uh, it is full detail in the sense that it does have an engine in it. However, as you'll see, it's not a full, full model kit the way, say, the 2010 Ford Mustang GT or the 2013 Boss 302 were. So, without further ado, the camera, and we'll be right back. Alright, guys, so the first thing we're going to take a look at here is the decal sheet. Uh... A fairly small one, but it is actually, uh, you know, real decals as opposed to being uh, something that's printed onto the body. Uh, you get the sort of blacked out area around the, for the rear trunk and the rear tail lights. Uh, you see the stripes here for the sides that are uh, shown on the box art for the custom version. You also get a, a GT uh, 
Wait a minute. Why am I pointing out those my finger? <laughs> Let's be professional here. You get a GT uh, decal for the gas filler, the Mustang racing uh, horse, prancing horse, if you will, for the front grill. Over here, you have a couple of license plates, a couple of just Ford plates, which, you know, if you don't use them for this, could always be used for something else. Uh, they're, you know, reasonably nice little license plates there. Uh, you've got some Recaro uh, decals for the seats, some 5.0 rolling in my 5.0 logos there. Uh, you'll notice there's turn signal, or I should say turn signal, marker lights. Uh, the rear brake light is here. The rear marker lights are here. For some reason, uh, in Ravel's world these days, nobody can do detail painting on marker lights anymore, so we just give you the decals for them. These four down here, of course, are for the uh, stock wheel inserts. And then up here, you have, if it'll focus, I think I'm going too many things at once there. There it goes. Let me get it tipped towards the camera so you can actually see it. You have your uh, gauges for your dashboard. And then you've got like an oil cap logo and some airbag logos and oh, just a bunch of different engine uh, decals there. So, I mean, it's a fairly robust decal sheet in that sense of it being, uh, you know, for the factory stock version, it's, well, I mean, all of the decals are used even on the custom version because, of course, the custom version isn't really all that custom. Uh, let's go to the instruction sheet for half a second. You'll see it's just your standard Revell instruction sheet that we've become used to over the past several years. Uh, it's got your alphabetized I can get this to fold in half. Your alphabetized paint callouts, and then your numeric parts listing, which will tell you the, the part number, what it is, and then, of course, what it is in Spanish and in French for the North American releases of it. You will see the kit here does have an engine. It's, uh, let's see, two, four, five, yeah, seven, nine. That's yeah, nine pieces, basically, for the engine itself. And then there will be a, a, a top, basically, to it. You go into your next steps over here. Uh, this front splash pan and uh, upper, what should we technically be, lower A-arms, are the only suspension to this kit. There is no rear suspension. It's all molded in. Uh, your interior assembles in a really weird way where your uh, dashboard attaches to your, to your door panels, which then go in a bucket-style interior. Your seats are two parts. So, you know, it's interesting to see what they chose to make two parts and what they chose to make one part. Over here is your installation of your uh, of your engine and, and uh, mating of the interior to the chassis, installation of the radiator. Here are your two other engine parts. It is sort of the intake plenum uh, and a the air box and some associated little lines here. But the car it runs on magic because it has no radiator hoses. Uh, you get a little chunk of a firewall, a... a uh, Shock, uh, a, a, should shock, a strut tower, and then here are your choice of wheel assemblies. As you see here, there are metal axles up front and out back, so uh, yeah, yeah. Everybody hated those uh, AMT showroom replica kits, but yet here's one that's pretty much just a slightly more complicated version of that, and uh, yeah, everybody thought this kit was fantastic for some reason. Coming over here, you install your glass, you see it is one piece. Uh, you have a one-piece uh, headlight insert and a one-piece headlight back. And then you go into your final assembly here telling you basically uh, to paint the front apron area of the uh, underhood black, where to put your decals, assembling the body, putting in your rear tail lights, and then your choice of your hoods. You get a, a, a complete decal listing here for your factory stock version. And then on the back, there's one for your... Uh, custom version. I actually think that the, the irony of this, the custom version that has these black uh, five spokes, these black five spokes with the chrome lip look a hell of a lot better than they do fully chrome, but maybe that's just me. Alright, so moving on to kit contents. Let me go into the bottom here so we can get everything out. I know it's thrilling. It's like you're looking at a Windows blue screen of death, right? Alrighty. So, in this baggie here, we have our nondescript, because there's no sidewall detail, because Revell can't pay for licensing. And we're used to that by now, so it's not a, necessarily a big knock, it's just a fact of life. Your nondescript uh, factory stock tires. Uh, I'm sure that, the, you know, in reality, the side profile here is way too tall. 
Uh, that's just a Ravel thing. You know, you make the wheels tiny, and then you uh, put a giant sidewall on the tire. Be nice if that said Goodyear or Firestone or something. And then it does have a, you know, halfway decent tread pattern to it. You know, it's passable as a tire. It's not nearly as bad as, say, sticking a 1970s bias ply tire into a 1980s Oldsmobile. Then you have uh, your big uh, low profile tires. Uh, these are the same that have been in numerous Revell kits as of recent. Or, well, pretty much everything has California wheels. They are uh, much larger. They're much uh, more uh, weak, 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 flexible. They're like rubber bands, quite literally. And uh, they actually have a pretty reasonable uh, tread pattern on them, too. Maybe, yes. No, maybe so. I think you see the tread pattern of my arm hair quite nicely, but not the actual tread pattern on this tire. Well, that's annoying. Move the two of them side by side. Try to try to cut down on the background. There we go. So yeah, I mean that's probably a pretty passable tread. It looks like something that uh, you'd actually see on the road. It's not some weird goofy thing. But like I said, these are these are for the big wheels. They are actually quite larger than the uh, street tires, as you'll see here in a second. I can fish one out. You can actually take one of the street tires and without really too much fiddling around here, you can fit the street tire inside the low profile tire. So that shows you how much bigger the, the wheel size is. So let's put those away. Put these tire, these low profile tires back where they belong because they're going to a friend who wants all the custom parts, quote unquote, from this kit. And then we have the custom tires here. This is just a little separate uh, chrome tree that's in its own little plastic bag. Wish they would tape these shut or staple them shut the way the Japanese do so you don't have to tear the bags all the pieces and back. But there you go. Here are your uh, five spoke wheels that uh, are for the custom version. Just trying to think of something to put behind it so it would focus in. I'm going to take this thing and just raise it up. That's what I'm going to do. If I can without dropping it. Hey, ha, ha. Show me. I can figure it out. Uh, so, like I said, custom wheels. They do have that, uh, that nifty, and I'm being incredibly sarcastic here, paddle wheel feature that uh, all Ravel tires... Uh, wheels now have uh, to make them you know, completely and totally ineffectually fit anything else other than Revolve's tires. It's a unique marketing move. It's basically a giant screw you if you want to call it that, where it's like, hey, our tires fit our wheels, and that's that's all they fit because, you know, there's giant, huge uh, paddles on our things. So going into the clear bag here, i got a bit of a pair of scissors out so I can actually cut this because tearing it is taking too long. Clear runner, very small, as you could probably imagine. It's only 60 pieces, so there's not a lot to talk about. And here you go. It is the one-piece glass and the uh, headlight area. The headlight area, as you see here, is just one uh, piece that fits with a couple of uh, holes in it into the grill itself. And then there is this one-piece uh, glass. Which does have, you know, a, a frosting area around it so you can see where to paint uh, your black window trim. Please paint your window trim black. It looks awful when you leave it clear. It's not frosted for the frosted flake goodness of it. On the inside here, you've got an overhead console and a couple of uh, sun visors in there along with a couple of really good uh, punch holes there from the... Uh, Ejector pins. Wow, those are really standing up too. Well, they should be easier to get off, get off when they're uh, raised rather than recessed. But wow, that's a <laughs> that's a heck of a punch. That shows you right there that these you know kits are uh, more designed for the kiddies rather than the adult hobbyists. Uh, but you know, if you're gonna paint that uh, to match the interior color, which of course you would because that's the headliner, eh, it may disappear on its own. A little couple swipes of the file or some sandpaper and it's going to go away on its own anyway. It's not like it's a giant 
you know, oh my god, I can't believe it type situation there. Uh, there we go. For some reason my thing went, my backdrop went haywire. So that takes us into three small runners that make up the chassis in the, well, actually four, that make up the chassis in the, in the uh, engine here. You have this. Here's your chassis. As you see here, your exhaust and your rear end and your back, well, you're obviously your rear end of your exhaust, uh, all molded into the chassis. Woohoo! Yay, we shall be happy because they made us a modern car, right? Um, this is kind of, if anybody's actually seen the way one of these uh, chassis looks in real life, it's painted a, a weird olive green chrome uh, chromate uh, anti-rust uh, thing. A lot of people have tried jet exhaust and gold and various other colors to replicate that. Uh, but it's a very detailed, uh, if you really want to spend the time to do it, uh, chassis on the glue kits, like starting from the 2006 one up through the newer ones, where the chassis itself is one color, and then you have, of course, the exhaust and your resonators and your cats and then your back exhaust, which, of course, has that awful thing of everything melting into the chassis uh, itself. The same thing goes for the rear end. It's, you know, five miles tall instead of just being a separate piece. I really don't think, especially, you know, if you're going to take a sort of a monogram look to this where you're trying to make it simplified, at least monograms, you know, rear end and and, and drive shaft and stuff, were, you know, they all came as a separate piece. It might have been all molded into one big piece, but at least it was separate. Because now you have this weird situation where, you know, you've got to try to pick out this half of the drive shaft in front of the resonators, and then this in front of the drive shaft up here that goes into the engine, and... You know, this, the fuel tank and the, and the lines under the fuel tank should all be, tip it so you can see it rather than just me looking at it. But all of this is, is a different color than the actual fuel tank or the spare tire uh, fuel tank area itself because this, the fuel pump and stuff because the fuel tanks are actually here. Uh, but these fuel tanks are a different color and the straps are a different color and it's, it's a lot of stuff going on here that almost, you want to take this as be, just being a quick build and not trying to make anything out of it, because this really becomes one of those headache things that uh, turns a lot of people off to uh, Japanese kits that are more basic. That everything's molded in, and it's just a pain in the tokus to try to get anything done with as far as detailing. This small runner here has your front uh, splash pan and your control arms and lower A arms and uh, tie rod steering uh, parts as well. And for some reason, the dashboard attached to it. Um, the engraving on the splash pan itself is not bad. It's certainly not, you know, oh my god, I can't believe they did this kind of thing. And you see here, whoops, <laughs> hit the camera, that the engraving on the dashboard is about what you'd expect for any of the Ford Mustang kits that Ravel has done in the past. So not bad uh, whatsoever. Uh, you see here, your this thing has axle blocks molded into the side of it. Uh, there's three holes, so theoretically speaking, depending on how you wanted to build this, you could uh, lower the suspension somewhat, although you'd have to sort of uh, widen out these holes a little bit because only the middle one is wide enough for the axles. Uh, let's see here. This runner has your intake pendulum, your exhaust headers, your firewall, and your brakes. Uh, the brakes do not have any type of rotor detail per se. They're flat. Uh, they at least have calipers, so there's that going on for them. They, they do have two giant pin, uh, mounting bosses on the back so that you can uh, mount them into that uh, axle block. And that also sort of defeats the ability to be able to uh, mount the wheels in a different place because these pins will fit into those two other holes. Um Let's see here, your intake pendulum, good engraving, be nice maybe if it was two pieces, but at the same time, you probably wouldn't get it in two pieces in a real key either. Has a little 5-0 engraved on, the, uh, on it as well, decent uh, exhaust headers, not bad. Seen plenty of worse ones, that's for sure. And, uh, you know, all in all, not a bad, not a bad engraving, not a bad attempt there. 
And then lastly, you have this runner right here, which has your engine halves, your uh, oil pan, and uh, I guess would be technically the transmission pan on this thing, uh, your serpentine belt, the front engine cover, and your valve covers. The engraving on the engine itself is, uh, if I can get it into the frame without you know breaking the camera, actually pretty good. Certainly uh, not a weak effort by any stretch of the imagination. You'd like to see kind of more parts, but I am uh, happy with the fact that the oil pan and the tranny pan, or at least whatever the heck this big long thing sticking off the oil pan is supposed to represent, uh, is one piece, so at least it'll hide that bottom seam on the engine, meaning it's a little less cleanup work. Of course, you'll have to uh, take care of that top seam, especially because of the lack of, of detail that the kit presents and the you know, the firewall area, it's going to only have that little bit of a firewall, so it's not going to wrap around the engine real tight. There's your serpentine and the front cover, engine cover, uh, you know, water, uh, water pulley, wow. Your water pump, it's got the uh, oil filter molded to it as well. And then you have these uh, cylinder heads here, which hopefully we can get it focused, have uh, powered by Ford engraved into them quite nicely. Uh, so, again, it's not bad. Uh, you kind of see where this would go had it been full detail. Uh, and it kind of frustrates you that it's not, actually. And then there's one more bag here that has uh, your engine and your or your body and your interior and a few of the things in it here. So let's get everything out without breaking everything and dropping everything if we can here. Da, 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 da. Much shadows. <laughs> Uh, you get a bag with your metal axes in it. Nothing to see there, right? And if you're of a certain age, you know what these are. If you're of a certain other age, you're like, metal axles? The hell is that for? Uh, there's uh, another chrome tree in here. I'm not going to take this out because you guys can see through it. It has the uh, factory stock uh, rims in it. Also paddle wheel. Uh, it has the headlight reflectors that back that one-piece headlights uh clear glass piece and it has your uh, gas cap which actually does have a GT already engraved in it so you don't really need the decal you just need to detail paint so there's that um, this little piece right here little small runner has your interior basically all of it uh, except for the dashboard uh, you have your two-piece Recaro seats Not bad engraving. Uh, I'm not sure how productively correct they are necessarily. Uh, being that they're molded this way, uh, at least you do get the uh, injector pins being on like the inside of the back of the seat and the inside of the seat back, rather than being on the seat back itself and having to clean that up. So that's nice. And they do, if I can get this up here close enough where it'll focus, maybe. Eh. For some reason I got a really good good picture of my knuckles. There we go. You'll see it has the uh, little levers on it to fold the seats uh, forward so you can get the tiny, tiny people in the back seat out. And then you have your door panels, which uh, appear to have decent engraving. I'm not sure. I'd have to look at a picture of a 2014 Mustang to see if they're prototypically correct, but they're not bad. They're, at least they're not, you know, flat with no plane on them. Uh, you've got your, you know, your door handle, and that's pretty much it. There's power window buttons on there as well and you have little itty bitty uh, speakers up here so obviously this is the premium edition with the Bose sound system uh, you have two runners here that have hoods second half thought that was cracked it's just a giant hair <laughs> still got the giant hair get off their hair um, stock hood cowl hood and there's two sets of mirrors. They are, uh, I'm trying to see here, the parts are numbered the same way, so obviously this kit was designed, uh, you know, with this hood and these mirrors. I don't know why you would tool a new hood with new mirrors, though. I, I, I don't get that. These are the same, these mirrors are identical to one another, there's nothing different about them. Uh, the reason they look kind of funny is because, well, they're on here upside down for these ones, but if you set them side by side like that, well, then they're the exact same mirror. Uh, I'm, I'm guessing that in re in the mold they're uh, connected that way right there. And uh, there's actually some fairly decent engraving on the bottom of the cowl induction hood. 
Uh, you know, got a few uh, little nooks and crannies for the hood insulation and things like that. Uh, which makes it all the more entertaining that there's just sort of a fake cowl induction hood in this kit in the first place. And then your factory stock uh, hood, it also has some really nice engraving on the bottom for the insulation uh, as well. And you have your hood latch there. So again, really nice engravings, some really nice pieces. Uh, the, the louvers are you know, adequate. They're not very deep per se. You're not going to lose them in primer or nothing, but uh, you know, it's okay, and from the looks of it, uh, there's not really any shadowing through, because a lot of times when you get hoods like this that have a lot of engraving in the in the backside, and they're of a certain thinness, if you want to call it that, you'll get the uh, engraving on the backside ghosting through the front side, and these seem to be at least thick enough from the onset. Maybe there's a little ghosting of the hood latch there, but yeah, not too much. Uh, that you have a situation where you know you can you have a undulation all over the hood of the engraving, and this course because of the nature of the cowl induction hood doesn't have any of it at all. So there's your two hood choices. Uh, you get one little uh, red runner here, red rum, red rum of the that has your tail lights in it, just two piece uh, plastic tail lights. Nothing to really write home about. They're sort of expected. They do have a peg on the back to fit into the body. And then that leaves pretty much two things at this point. That is the interior tub. Oh, there's one little rat left, runner left. And uh, so we'll go with the interior tub first. It is a tub style interior. As we showed you in the instructions, that you do have separate door panels or door cards, as Elliot would call them. And they, they you actually mount them to the dashboard and then you put the whole thing in here at once. Uh, overall, the interior engraving looks pretty decent. Uh, let me tip it this way so you guys can see what I see. Um, there's not a, <laughs> that's kind of an odd little thing. There's no knob for this gear shift, and there's no knob in the parts for it either. So, essentially, someone came and, uh, while well, you weren't paying attention, completely and totally jacked the shift, the uh, knob off your uh, shifter. You know, if you ever had a stick shift car, uh, which I know there's a certain, you know, percentage of people out there that have never had a stick shift car, Stick shift car is the, 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 the knob on top that has, you know, the pattern in it and is the top of the stick shift. Put it on screw off there so that you can put different ones on or so that if you needed to, say, drop the transmission, it wouldn't get hung up when you drop the pan, when you drop the uh, transmission out the bottom of the car. So, uh, yeah, yeah, there's, there's, <laughs> there's no knob on the shifter. That's, that's an interesting problem. It has an engraved uh, parking brake uh, that sort of melts away into nothingness there and has no defined uh, button on the end, per se, for, you know, the releasing it. There are uh, seat belt... Let me see here. Give me this one. My big fat fingers aren't in there. There are seat belt... Uh, you know, see the, the latches... Whoops. Ha <laughs> ha! There we go. The latches that, uh, you know, you... The seatbelt receptacles are molded into the back seat here, so that's a nice touch. And uh, you've got the latch system for your uh, car seat in there as well. Uh, this this uh, kit, the way it's designed to go together, will not necessarily accept the glue kit parts. And you'll see, like here, there are giant mounting bosses on the back here to make it attach to the chassis pan. Uh, obviously, the the uh, glue kit doesn't have those, nor is it the nor is this you know the glue kit's part. Obviously. Can it may be made to fit? I'm sure if you're a modeler, you can make anything fit, but it's not designed to go that way. One last little runner here. We lied and said there weren't any more, but here's this last one. Uh, this has your uh, radiator, which has pretty nice electric fan detail on the front. Uh, it is sort of three-dimensional in the fact that you can see the radiator behind the fan. That'll take some uh, real careful detail painting since this isn't two pieces. You know, you'd like this in real life to be a radiator and the fan on the front. Here's to paint the radiator and then assemble it. Uh, there is, however, no back to it. Oh, wah, 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 wah. That's okay. You can't see through the front grill anyway because it's a solid piece, but that's kind of amusing because the drawing on the instructions shows a radiator engraved into here that doesn't exist. Uh, so you've got your steering wheel. <laughs> I've got a cat that's going to, if he hits the button the right way, he's going to turn my camera off and move my mouse out of the way. <laughs> uh, and this is, your, of course, your uh, whoops, your air box, which has, I don't know, a couple of things going off of it here. I don't know what they're supposed to represent necessarily. 
uh, obviously some sort of emissions control type things, but they're not radiator hoses and they're not air conditioning hoses either. So, you know, whatever. Uh, <laughs> he still managed to still managed to hit something anyway. Good kitty. And then you have your uh, strut tower here. I'm going to bring it up close so you can see, hopefully, maybe, I know I'm, I'm asking for too much here. There it goes. You can see it has a GT logo engraved into the middle of it there. So, again, some nice engraving work. This kit's sort of one of those uh, whole things where it's a, a bunch of odd decisions, uh, you know, nailed together, if you will. This last piece, of course, would be the body. Hobby Cat's on the other side of the table, but doesn't look like he's going to come over. Um, molded in uh, trunk duck lip spoiler back here. And of course, uh, up front here, your wipers are molded into the to the scuttle panel. Uh, your overflow for your coolant is molded into the body itself. There are, make sure you can actually see them, which of course, you know, white and cameras, so I apologize for the fact this is probably going to take eight attempts to get it to focus. Oh, Bobby Cat draws nearer. <laughs> I hope he doesn't knock the camera over. Can I get it this way? If I just point at it. Uh, no, I can't. Anyway, there's a 5.0 logo engraved in there. I think you guys can see it from here. And, hey, it's a hobby kitty. And the camera's going to get knocked over now. <laughs> this is the part where I should stop the camera and just go with it, but I'm going to let it go. Because he's going to... This is... A bad, bad kitty. He knocked the camera over and interrupted our review of this thrilling piece of junk from Ravel. <laughs> Could you please get down now and wait until after the video for appropriate amounts of kitty attention? Thank you. Anyway, so, like I said, there's... <laughs> I'm still giggling about the cat. Sorry, guys. There is a 5.0 logo engraved here. I've got a different cam camera set up in a different post here, so at least it looks like that's working. Uh, your back end here is all one big piece. If we can get it to stop being so glary. There we go. And then your front end. And your front end, as you see here again, uh, all basically one piece. Okay, engraving on the front there. I don't know that the 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 egg crateness of it seems to be a little bit big to me, but I, I I'm not sure. I can't be, you know, one of those don't hold me to it type of uh, deals in the sense of whether or not that's prototypically in scale. Uh, this kit, I do know one thing. I do notice about this kit, the body compared to the other ones, because I have every other Mustang that they've made from 2006 forward is awful heavy. It's not uh, not as light as the other ones were. It's a it's a it's a pretty chunky, thick body. Again, may probably because it's designed, again, for beginner modelers who are going to be a little rougher around the edges uh, as far as handling goes. And then, uh, you know, it's also eh, borderline a toy. It's not really a build-and-play, but it's the next level uh, from build-and-play. I will say right now that you have a mold line that comes off of the rear uh, roof area here, runs down the actual... <laughs> And that's a great sanding place, too. Runs down the side of the C-pillar and then comes across the trunk in this area right here. And then uh, makes its uh, Brexit uh, back here. And then you have... Uh, trying to see where that line goes afterwards. Uh, pretty much go, runs straight down the side of the uh, back here. On the front, your mold line comes off the, off the roof. Runs out onto the edge of the front fender and runs pretty much makes a big makes a very sharp front fender uh, creases and then uh, comes down goes around the edge of the headlight trim right here around the edge of the headlight trim right here it makes a diagonal uh, exit and then runs down the very edge of the front it's an awful weird wobbly uh, mold line and it literally it literally does a uh, I don't know, let me get this up here close enough so you guys can see it. It makes a weird sort of little little up down here. It doesn't follow the inner fender, at least on mine. Uh, 
and this one doesn't on this side either. It'd be great if this would show you guys. I don't know if it'll show up because again, it's a whole white on white thing, and eh. But yeah, I'll take my word for it. It doesn't run on the inner edge of the fender like you'd expect it to. It runs in the outer edge of the fender and does a little whoop de woo going down the side there. So it's not like the straightest thing in the world. So uh, that, guys, is that. Uh, I really probably should have took out one of the other uh, bodies from one of the, the glue kits to see if the glue, if see how this thing is dimensionally speaking compared to the glue kit, but I did not, and I'm not about to go dig it out now. So, on to uh, our final thoughts. Okay, so what do we think of this box of plastic? Well, I mean, it's not terrible. It's not bad. Uh, I, I, you know, from initial appearances, when you consider what the item is, considering, you know, it's a unpainted version of a pre-painted kit designed at uh, basically a little bit beyond entry-level modelers, but really at the entry-level modeler, because really, remember, guys, the build-and-play stuff and to a certain extent, the Snap Type Max stuff are designed for children. Uh, the the build and play stuff is designed for children under the age of eight. Really, from five to eight is what the uh, tip in point is. And then your Snap Type kits are from eight to ten. And then this kit and the uh, pre paints are designed for like ten to twelve. And then it goes into the glue kits with the you know first range being like twelve to fifteen. And then the, the Level fives being fifteen and over, which is uh, you know, a dubious distinction because of course the levels are based on the kit part content rather than the the actual uh, you know build level, if you will, of the model. Yeah, so the good. So the. The kit has good engraving on a number of parts. The hoods have very nice underhood engraving, which is something that is uh, missing on a number of kits. Uh, the engine is uh, pretty well done, considering how simplified it is. Uh, the interior seems to be pretty uh, decent as well, considering again how how you know basic it is. I think everything about this kit is, and you know, at least a slightly above average, other than obviously the chassis. Now the chassis does fall into that category of uh, you know. It is what it is because of what the way the kit is designed. Uh, I just think that uh, you know, in an overall sense, I think that you know it'll make a 2014 Ford Mustang. Ah, the bad. Well, the bad is uh, you know the kit itself for an adult hobbyist. Yes. It makes a 2014 Ford Mustang. Yes, it's a pretty decent weekend build, a 48-hour build, even a 24-hour build if you got some, uh, you know, fast-drying paint. Uh, you know, the guys who do the 24-hour build, like me, uh, although mine was, of course, many, many hours late because I slowed it down to do, uh, you know, pay more attention to it. The guys who do 24-hour builds, we know what paint to use, you know, to, to, to gas out and be able to clear and then maybe be able to even polish, depending uh on the situation. So, yeah, this is definitely a 24 hour build type of kit. 60 pieces, and you consider that you're not going to use, uh, you know, a, a, at least 8 or 10 of them, depending, because uh, you're not going to use one of the two hoods. You're not going to use two of the four mirrors. You're not going to use four of the eight wheels, four of the eight tires. So, there's really, you know, you start getting into the 45 part uh, neighborhood there, depending on which uh, choice you make as far as, well, they're both the same. They're, you're both losing the same amount of parts. So there's about 48 pieces uh, for this kit when you put it together. The, the other bad parts are, well, there's no radiator hose. Uh, you know, the, the the stuff on the accessory bracket floats in midair, but that's a modeling thing in general. Um, the interior has that weird construction where the side panels are separate from the interior tub itself but they're not separate side panel panels like they would be on a, on a traditional model kit. And, of course, uh, you know, <laughs> the radiator has no back to it, which you can't see, allegedly. I think you need to put this together and see if whether or not you'll be able to see behind the radiator or not. The radiator has no front or back, depending on how you look at it. And it shows it having one in the drawing. So, apparently, at some point in time, 
having an engraved radiator on the back of the or front of the radiator was a plan. It just never made it to fruition. And the ugly. Now, I know some people will be like, well, there was no ugly on that BMAX Civic. Yeah, well, the BMAX Civic, it didn't really have a whole heck of a lot of problems. There may be nitpicky problems if you're really, really into Civics and really, really into JDM Racing Civics, where some parts weren't, you know, necessarily molded uh, the way they should be, or at least the, there's some shapes that aren't correct. But I don't know what those are, and nobody seems to be able to tell me. It's, it's like the... Uh, Meng F-350, some people dubbed as unbuildable and then couldn't give reasons why. The ugly in this kit really does come down to this mess of the chassis. Uh, you know, <laughs> interesting backlight I got going on this camera here, but yeah, this whole thing. I don't understand why the AMT showroom replica kits got such... Mounds of hate leaked, uh, just poured into them. Yeah, they were curbside uh, in the sense they didn't have an engine at all. But this isn't really that much better. I mean, you know, I, one thing I forgot to show in the video itself on the review is that, you know, there's your... <laughs> that's what the, you know, the, the top half of the engine bay looks like. So everything molded in there as well. And, you know, so your... The, the battery, the... Uh, uh, I don't know what that would be. It's really the charcoal canister for the air conditioner. No, well, that stuff just melts off into infinity. Yeah, the battery, you know, doesn't itself melt off forever. Whoops. Ha! Keep forgetting I'm in reverse sometimes. But the bracket it's on does. And, you know, I don't know. I'm not impressed with this, <laughs> this being the end result of our modern car tooling at Revell. Oh, because, you know... Those are, those, those right there, <laughs> this, this mess, which, you know, is, doesn't want to focus, that's the exhaust pipes on this car, that, those rectangular tubes that come out of the back of those melting forever, uh, exhaust, uh, melting forever mufflers, that's it, there's no separate pieces for the exhaust, I guess technically speaking there might be exhaust tips that are molded into the back of the body, but, you know, the, the, the glue kits, the, the glue kit had, you know, metal exhaust tips. Uh, that, to me, is the ugly. Because I think if you're going to do this, this kit in this simplified monogram-esque, if you will, thing, you made it too simplified in the sense that everything, you, you, your, your suspension is one piece, and that's basically just the top of the... Uh, you know, the, what would be one of the bottom of the chassis at that point, the lower A arms and stuff like that, and the splash pan, because you couldn't mold the splash pan on the chassis itself, because that would limit the things you could do with the chassis. I get the tooling compromise, but it's just, I don't understand why we had, for a long time running, a series of Mustang kits 2006 GT, 2007 uh, Hearst. Uh, the Hearst, <laughs> yeah, well, Hertz rental car version. Uh, then you had like a uh, Shelby GT500, and then the Shelby uh, KR, and then there was a 2010 Mustang GT, and a 2010 Mustang GT500, and the 2013 Mustang Boss 302, and then Ravel went, meh. And uh, that's pretty much been what the automotive tooling for modern muscle cars and Ravel has been. Meh. This is as good, this is probably as close to a full detail kit as you're going to get. And what really sucks about that is that this car is the first one that has the Coyote engine in it. The 302 uh, Boss doesn't have the Coyote engine in it. It has the other uh, older motor in it. A lot of people would like to take the engine out of this and put it into a street rod or a hot rod or, you know, any number of things. And while you technically could do that with this engine, it's not so bad that you couldn't transplant it into something. The fact that it's not full detail and the fact that, you know, a lot of the stuff like the starter and everything is molded into it, I think detracts from its ability to look good in other scenarios. It'll look okay in this model kit because it's designed to go into this model kit. And, you know, 
the fender wells and everything will hide the lack of detail. Uh, you know, a modern car, you don't see that much of the engine, you know, the whole everything on top is plastic kind of deal. So a lot of it gets hidden away so where you can't see it. But if you put it into a 32 Ford, you would not be able to hide the shortcomings of the engine. And while that really doesn't, I guess, technically isn't a bad thing about this kit or an ugly thing about this kit, it just presents a little bit of one of those, you know, makes you scratch your head, short-sighted Revell things that they like to do, where you're like, you know, you could have done this, and I bet you people would have bought this kit for the engine. People, I don't know anybody of my friends that has one of these. I literally am the only one of my friends that I know has one of these. I didn't buy the ZL1 because I have the showroom replica AMT version of it. And to me, buying another one just for another nine-part engine uh, was not worth the uh, aggravation to me. Uh, I'm not that big of a Ford guy. I do have quite a number of Fords, as it turns out, if I look at them. But I'm not that big of a Ford guy. I just am a... a well, procession is not the word I'm looking for, but a succession, a succession person, not succession, because that would be like taking the south of the United States. But I like the ability to continue to build, uh, you know, further kits. I guess that's you know every hobbyist probably has a certain sense of that because uh, pretty much everybody who who you know started building prior to 1996 probably would be a good year was raised on annual kits. We built the next car all the time. And the Mustang is one of those kits, like the Corvette, like the Camaro, that has always had, except, of course, the Camaro didn't exist for that block of time, always had the next kit has always come out. That has always been Monogram or AMT or MPC, uh, always had the next Mustang, always had the next Corvette, always had the next Camaro. And uh, that stopped where the last glue kit Camaro uh, Corvette is the 2010-01. The last uh, glue Camaro is the 2010 SS. The last glue Mustang is the 2013 Boss 302. And what's really interesting about that is the Boss 302 is, uh, is actually like new tooling. It's not the same tooling as this kit either. So they really tooled up two separate new tools uh, to sort of take the Mustang along. And it could be maybe that the Mustangs didn't sell and I'm the only one with all of the Mustang kits. But, uh, you know, it's just one of those things where as they sit there and they try to puzzle out this fine line of making too many toys or making not enough cars for kids, uh, you got to remember that not only children want to build new cars and not all children want to build new cars either, which leaves you in a weird gap where you're making kits like this where, uh, you know, without making myself sound important, an adult, serious adult hobbyist looks at this kit and goes, eh. I don't know. The reason I bought this kit personally is because it is the next Mustang, and it is the last Mustang kit that I will probably buy, because I do not see at this point a full detail, or even a detailed in this way, 2015-2016 Mustang coming. Do you? I mean, if somebody has some inside information that I'm not aware of, I'd love to hear it, but I don't see the new body style Mustang coming out is a real model kit. I just don't see it. It would have been done by now, or we would have at least heard rumblings about it by now. Maybe the fourth quarter, I'll be surprised, or the first quarter of next year. But uh, I think, you know, the time hasn't passed because it, because it's still a brand new car. It's still a fresh body style. But you would expect it to already have been announced and uh, be on its way. Um I still like to see a full glue kit Corvette as well. And, you know, if I have to buy trans kits to get the stuff done, I guess I have to buy trans kits to get the stuff done. Guys who watch the weekly show know that the uh, Plasmo 2000, Plasmos 2013 GT500 kit has come out. Uh, it's a $62 resin trans kit to turn the 2010 Shelby GT500 into a 2013 Shelby GT500. And I find it odd and amusing and somewhat disheartening that I have to pay that much money plus I gotta you know pony up another like eight 17 18 bucks for another uh, GT500 Revel kit base kit uh, that I'm spending somewhere in the neighborhood of now basically a hundred bucks decals or trans kit real kit to build something that Revel should have done in their Mustang series and I gotta get some guy from Hong Kong to do it for me 
globalization, I guess, but still not all that great. Anyway, guys, we hope you enjoyed it. I've just been sort of been blathering now for the last 10 minutes. Uh, we'll uh, you know, be back with more reviews, uh, hopefully sooner than later, so that all of you people that uh, watch this channel for the... This will be the fifth total review I've ever done. We'll be happy. <laughs> anyway, uh, see you guys on the other side.